Hello, Psych 101 students, and welcome to Module 5, Chapter 7, Learning Objective 4. What types of long-term memories do you store? And we'll begin with the story of Henry Mollison, or H.M., as, as he's, he was known for most of his life, and how I have always known him and, until recently. Um, one of the most famous case study subjects in, in psychology's history. He had a radical surgery at the age of 26 to, he, he, it was in order to treat severe epilepsy. And uh, they removed part of his temporal lobes. It's the blue regions shown in the, in the brain picture there. And it, this included his hippocampus. Um, this caused him to not be able to form new memories. As you may, may remember from module two, we talked about how the hippocampus is needed to create a new memory. Um, anyways, uh, like I said, he was known to known by his initials for, for many years. This is, I always knew him as HM for, you know, since the 1980s. And um, so for, for about 30 years or so, he was HM to me until they finally released his name. Uh, he, um, he ended up dying in a nursing home in 2008. Um, and after that, they, they made his identity known. But he was, he was always HM to me. <laughs> Anyways, let's go on here. He's, so he's, he, he had his hippocampus removed, could not form any new memories. So there are two types of amnesia, retrograde amnesia, as it says here, is a condition in which people lose the ability to access memories they had before a brain injury. So it's a loss of your past memories. Um, and anterograde amnesia is a condition in which people lose the ability to form new memories after experiencing brain injury. So it's a loss of ability to make new memories. And HM, he, he had, after his operation, uh, he experienced mild retrograde amnesia, but very severe anterograde amnesia. He, uh, he lived to the age of 82. So for the last 55 years of his life, he was not able to form memories of any of his experiences. So amnesia... Uh, the two forms of amnesia are shown here in picture form, just to, I guess, make it simpler. So you see at the top, retrograde amnesia. You have some kind of brain damage occur. In the case of HM, it was due to his operation. And you would lose the ability to access older memories. This is very common. Uh, some form of retrograde amnesia is very common with with brain injuries, um, when people are in accidents and and they suffer um, a brain injury, they typically will you know lose some time before the brain injury in, in their memory. This is why it's very rare that anyone ever remembers the circumstances leading to the brain injury. So. Let's say you were in a car accident or something and, and you were knocked unconscious and, and suffered a head injury, like a brain injury, you you wouldn't you wouldn't remember be able to remember at least you know the moments leading up to the accident because you always lose some memory when when you do suffer a brain injury. If you're at least if you're um if you go into an unconscious state, some people lose large periods of time um, and uh, there have been cases where people you know will suffer brain injury and, and not remember anything from their past uh, in these cases of retrograde amnesia often over time memories start to return to the person um, 
anyway, so anterograde amnesia is is more of a, was more of HM's problem. You have brain damage, and it, it affects your ability to make newer memories. Um, and HM was was had severe anterograde amnesia, so like you could talk to HM. Let's say you you met him after his operation, and you might talk to him for an hour, and you go outside, you you go outside the room that you're talking to him to get a drink of water, and you come back a minute later, he won't remember that you just talked to him for an hour. Um, you know his his memory is is only short term, so he's he kind of lives in in you know twenty second increments, kind of you know where. Where you know if he he can't remember something that happened you know thirty seconds ago or one minute ago, um, obviously he had to be in in care for the the rest of his life. Is you can't you can't walk around this world like with with without the ability to form memories. You'll you'll never know where you're heading. You know you'll you won't remember where you just came from. You know you you won't remember where you live or you won't you know like it's and so he was he was in um in nursing homes or, or other facilities for for the remainder of his life apparently he was a a very good natured fellow and and he and he uh, um he allowed researchers to to study him um for for years of his life in fact, much of the knowledge of, of the different types of memory, memory, different types of long-term memory, come from studying HM and other subjects that have memory-related brain injuries. Sometimes you learn more about how a system like memory works when people have have damaged memories. You find out, you know, which part of the brain is damaged. You, you look at which part of the brain is damaged and what effects it has, and and by studying them, you can actually learn about how memory normally works when you see cases where it doesn't work properly, like in HM's case. Anyways, so long-term storage is composed of several several interacting types of memory. Uh, the two major types of memory are explicit and implicit memory. Explicit memory requires conscious effort, often to be verbally described. So you 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 purposely, you know, search your memory and and retrieve or recall something. Uh, two types of explicit memory are episodic and semantic memory. Episodic memory re refers to personally experienced events. Example is you got a great present on your last birthday and you can remember it. Semantic memory is facts and knowledge. Example is a tomato is a fruit, not a vegetable. The other major type is implicit memory, does not require conscious effort. So it's done unconsciously. You use implicit memory unconsciously. It often cannot be verbally described. Uh, two types of implicit memory are classical conditioning, uh, associating two stimuli, elicits a response. For example, your dentist uses a drill on your teeth and it hurts. So next time you are afraid of the dentist. So you didn't like set out to, to be afraid. It, it happened at an unconscious level. Uh, procedural memory, memory involves motor skills and habits. Example, you're able to play the piano and, you know, remember how to do it. And that's, you know, once again, an unconscious type of memory. Let's look at these further. Okay, explicit memory. Uh, the system of for long-term storage of conscious memories that can be verbally described. So explicit memory is also known as declarative memory because you can verbally describe the memory you it's like you're, you can declare what the memory is so it's called declarative memory well it's another name for it um, after the surgery hm could not encode any new explicit memories in long-term storage so he never could remember what day of the week it was he couldn't remember what year it was he couldn't remember his age um, or any other details like that. 
There are two types of explicit memory. Uh, the first is episodic memory, a type of explicit memory that includes personal experiences. So episodic memory refers to episodes, the events of your life. Mm -hmm. So example would be, you know, what did you eat for breakfast today? You know, you can search your memory and think back to that time. You can kind of picture yourself. Oh, yeah, I, you know, I had a bowl of cereal or whatever. Uh, or where where was your last birthday celebrated? Do you think back to your last birthday and think about the episode? So episodic memories involve situations where you're present. You know, it's, it's things that happened to you or in your presence. Um, the other type of explicit memory is semantic memory, a type of explicit memory that includes knowledge about the world. So this is knowledge of facts. This would include knowing dates or names, you know, remembering somebody's name, um, terms, um, you know, knowing what words mean, for instance, knowing that two plus two equals four. Um, example of a question would be, who was the first president of the U.S.? You know, when you answer that, you don't think of an episode of your life. You just, you know the, the fact and, 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 and you answer it because you've learned it. Okay, that's one. Uh, episodic memory can blur together events that repeat in your life. Um, this is, you know, true for, for events that, that repeat. So, you know, for instance, like daily events, like, like meals, like, you know, I asked you earlier to think about what did you eat for breakfast today? Well, let's say you try to think about, well, what did you eat for breakfast yesterday and the day before and the day before that? Like, how far can you go back? Um, thinking about what you ate for breakfast each day. Probably you would have trouble after, you know, maybe even after a few days. Um, because... If you if you regularly eat breakfast, it, you do it every day. So they kind of mash the memories mash together, you know. It's it, and so it becomes harder to sort them out. This is this is true also, you know. Like it could be yearly events, like birthdays, for instance. I've had a lot of birthdays, and I have a horrible memory for my birthdays. I mean, I. I don't remember what I did for my 50th birthday. I don't remember what I did for my 40th birthday. My 30th kind of stands out because it was, it was a really good party. But like all the ones in between, they're like, I, I don't remember. I remember what I did for my very last birthday because it was it was in June. So it wasn't very long ago. So I can recall that one. But even last year, even the year, you know, like one year ago, I don't remember what I did for my birthday. You know, I know I was probably with family, probably had some cake, probably got some gifts. But I do that every year. So they just all kind of blend together, you know, unless there's something special that happens or it's like to make it distinctive. So I remember a couple of my birthdays from when I was a young adult because I I, I used to throw, there was a couple of years I threw really, really great parties on my birthday. And and I remember, like I said, I remember my 30th birthday because it was, it was a really good party and, and I, a whole bunch of people showed up and I don't know. I can't really, I can't remember childhood birthdays or adolescent birthdays, like specifically, or, or really most of my adult birthdays. And, and, and it's because every year, you know, there's probably family and friends around. There's probably cake, there's probably gifts, and, and they just blur together. Uh, women tend to show better episodic memory than men across the lifespan, especially for events that can be described in words. This is certainly true. I would say in my in my marriage now, my my wife has seems to have tons of stories from her past that she constantly likes to bring up stories and re she remembers things from her childhood and her adolescence and her younger years and 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 it seems like she has much better episodic memory than I do, although I tend to have better um, better memory for for semantic memory and for, for facts and, and and things like that. Okay, let's go on. The, um, oh yeah, yeah, sorry, I forgot I want to talk about this. There's, there's a, a small number of people in the world with the condition known as 
highly superior autobiographical memory, HSAM. Research has shown that those with H HSAM who number under 100, there's under 100 known cases in the world, have accurate memories for autobiographical events using stringent criteria. Um, what this boils down to is, is, you know, I'll use this example of Marky Pasternak that your book mentions. I mean, she can remember details from every day of her life. And so you can pick a date, like, I don't know, you pick a date like, like July 16th, um, 2012 and you know which is over 10 years ago and and she'll start to talk about oh i wore my blue dress that day and i went to meet my friend sandra for lunch at this certain restaurant and and she'll remember what she ate i ordered the salmon that that day and and it, it's incredible like they 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 can think back to a specific day and remember details like uh, of what they did that day and and it can, and you know what they mean by stringent criteria here is that they they you know they they need to verify things so they so you have to, uh, the person has to be able to report on things that like might have occurred in the news and and then she was good at this she could she might say like oh on that day there was a, a dispute in the at the Panama Canal and and it was in the news and and, and so researchers can check out details like that um and verify that they're remembering, you know, incredible details from from a, a specific day. It's it's a really remarkable thing. I, I I often think about what it's like to to have that in your head to be able to remember any you know every day of your life um, in great detail. Uh, okay, so it's it's a you know a very abnormal brain condition. Um, it's probably. A blessing and a curse. I mean, I can see the advantages of it, but I, I think it's also a disadvantage if you can never forget anything. <laughs> Let's go on here. The second major type of memory is implicit memory. So we just look, looked at explicit memory, things that you you know consciously recall. A implicit memory is is more of an unconscious type of memory. So it's the system for long term storage of unconscious memories that cannot be verbally described. And so it's also known as non-declarative memory because you can't, you many of these types of memories you can't really put into words. So it's information that we don't remember deliberately. Um, examples would be, you know, I don't know, if I asked you, which way do you turn your key when you unlock your front door? Uh, many people have trouble answering that. And yet when they go to the front door to unlock it, they automatically turn it the right way. So it's like it's in their memory, but not in a conscious way. They can't they can't remember which way they turn it, but when they go to do it, it just they automatically get it right. Or it's like tying your shoes, your you know, your shoelaces. Um we all remember how to do that, but it's really difficult to put it into words to describe it without actually doing it. To just think about it and describe, you know, the process, and, and and it's so much easier to just to show somebody, which is you know how we teach people. We don't describe it in words because it's it's a memory of a, a particular skill that you learned. Um, HM cannot encode any new explicit episode episode memory, but he can learn new implicit procedural memory. This was one of the big findings. Uh, from research on HM, they found that even though he suffered this great um, debilitating um, um, injury to his, to his brain and to his memory to processes, he his implicit memory was was perfectly fine. So he could learn new skills and get better at things over time, even though he didn't remember doing those events. So an example is shown in the picture here. Um, he was, uh, they would, they had him do um, this tracing, this um, uh, uh, tracing, uh, it's, it's called a mirror drawing task. Sorry, it's a mirror drawing task. It's actually very difficult. You you can only look in the mirror and you try to trace a figure like, like that star that's in the picture. 
and it, it, it's difficult to do if you if you ever want to try it. Um, um, and over time, he got better and better at it. But if you would were to ask him, he would say, "Oh, I've never done this before. I've never, or I've never seen this procedure. I've never done it." And like even though they had him do it dozens of times, I mean, he could not actually consciously remember doing it. But he got better and better, better, which showed his implicit memory was learned, like he was learning on an unconscious level. Um, okay, so two types of implicit memory are classical conditioning and procedural memory. Uh, classical conditioning employs implicit memory. Uh, so, you know, as just to follow up on the example earlier, we have a picture here. You may le learn to associate a stimulus such as a dentist with a certain response such as pain. Um, I hate dentists, I'm afraid of them. So, you know, I, I've experienced this classical conditioning, but it's not a, it wasn't a conscious decision to be afraid of dentists. And, you know, it happened on the unconscious level because the dentist was paired with uncomfortable situations when, when I was a child. Um, a second type of implicit memory is procedural memory or what, what people often call motor memory. So it's a, it's a type of implicit memory that involves motor skills and behavioral habits. Examples, riding a bicycle. Um, touch typing would be another example. You don't think about it, you just do it. Um, going back to HM, another example from, from his life, he, he got better and better at playing tennis over the years, but he could never remember having played before. So you could ask him, like, have you ever played? He'd be like, no. And yet he would turn out to be really great because he's actually played, you know, dozens of times or hundreds of times or I don't know how many times they played tennis, but apparently played a lot of tennis, got pretty good at it. But he had no memory of being good or having played before. Um, so just to tie it up here. So when so, sometimes we get a lot of knowledge from case studies like studying HM and we discover that implicit and explicit memory were were stored in different parts of the brain that they were two completely different systems because he had damage to one but not the other and and this is the value sometimes of that we get from from case studies where somebody has um some type of brain injury and and you can find out you, you know you can often discover things that you wouldn't be able to with a healthy person and that will conclude learning objective four.